Today is uh, August the 2nd, 2010, and Art Anderson's with us here today. And he's going to tell us about his experiences in World War II uh, in the Navy and uh, anything else he wants to tell us. So, <laughs> so we'll get along good, and uh, here he is now. Art, uh, <clears throat> Arthur Anderson, how old are you? I'm 86 years young. 86, wow, what a guy. <clears throat> when were you born? August, I was born October 5th, 1923. 1923, okay. Now you, uh, we're going to talk about you coming into the Navy and doing all that sort of thing. Where were you born? Geneseo, Illinois, on a farm, nine miles north. Okay, how'd you end up out in Colorado here? Were you a kid here or something like that? or No. Uh, I transferred with Servimatia Matthias, a food service company. Okay. And, and uh, they, they transferred me to Regis College okay. where I was the food service director. Food service director in Regis. Wow, what a job. Why, uh, okay, now, <clears throat> how old were you when you entered the service? Do you remember? Yes. I was 17. 17, wow. And did you have to have your parents' permission? Uh, no. What happened to you? Well, did you just go sign up or? I lost my mother when I was five. Okay. And my father disowned me when I was 12. So I was on my own. And I just would had a well. I just went in and 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 signed up. They was taking you without too many questions then because uh, they was just about ready to draft you, and I didn't want to get drafted. I wanted to choose where I was going, and I wanted to get in the Navy. The Navy, yeah, good for you. And that was in uh, I've got down here August thirty first, nineteen forty one. That's correct. In Clinton, Iowa. And you were a 17 year old 17 kid. Year old. Right. And, and what happened to you then? They, wh where did you uh, enter the Navy? I was, uh, well, I went to Des Moines where I was put on a cattle train, you know, the slow boat to uh, the stop that ever melt stop. I finally got to uh, uh, Great Lakes Naval Training Station in Chicago. Ninth District, yep. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, is that where you had your boot tramp? That's where I had my boot training. Yes, in in uh, at Great Lakes. Great Lakes, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned how to fall out of a hammock. Fall out of a hammock, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hit the deck. Yeah, I was only four foot off it, so it wasn't too bad. <laughs> okay. What about uh, okay? So how long were you there at the? Uh, at the Great Lakes. I was there eight weeks. Eight weeks. For basic training. It rained on the day I was supposed to go to rifle practice, so I, I never did shoot a gun. Never, you say you never shot a gun? or never, never went out to rifle practice because it was raining that day, so I didn't get to go. You didn't get to do it, huh? No. So what happened then after, after boot camp? Well, then I was sent uh, uh, to Boston Annex 1, uh, and I stayed there for a few days, and then I took a ship, the Denimbola, on up to uh, Portland, Maine. And at Portland, Maine, I went out on Crow Island and Army Barracks out on Casco Bay and stayed there for a while just for further transfer, you know. And uh, then I, f I found a silver knife out there along the edge, and, and when at low tide, I, f I, I, f I, I shucked a bunch of oysters and took the pearls out of them past time, and then I finally got shipped out of there, and they shipped me uh, to go to Radjavik, Iceland. Radjavik. Radjavik, Iceland, where Iceland. my ship was. Uh -huh. However, when I got up to Newfoundland, my ship, the Von Trippets, got sunk, and uh, the Mississippi was no longer needed up there, 
So they headed back. So you had, yeah. The, the you see the biz, this German pocket battleship was up in a fjord, and and Hitler decided to move it two fjords closer, and then the British bombers at the Lancaster base, the Lancaster bombers went over and dropped three nine foot bombs. And it said they went straight through the ship, and the ship settled straight down. Wow. And so after it was sunk, the Mississippi was relieved of her responsibility and, uh, and came back. And then it had a war against storm, and the Mississippi's bow headed under the water, and all that was sticking out was the forecastle. I have a picture of it in there. And uh, it, it quivered and backed up, and then came on. The bow was knocked off, one of the ladders was twisted, the, the catapult on the fantail that shoots our planes off was torn off the deck, it has big bolts all the way around it, but it was just torn loose and washed off into the sea. Mm. And it was called Battle Against Storm. And the December issue of uh, 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 one of the magazines, it was on the front page. Anyway, it made it back. And uh, now, what was your position on the ship? What were you at that time? Well, at that time, I was not aboard the battleship Mississippi. I was, I was in. Uh, I only got to Newfoundland. Oh, okay. And they sent me aboard a subtender. Uh, and on this subtender, I was two days out of Newfoundland when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Okay. And. Uh, uh, Let's see that. I'm trying to think of that uh, uh, ship. But anyway, it was a uh, subtender that I came back on and in through the uh, canals of the Chesapeake Bay and down to uh, Portsmouth. And at Portsmouth is where I boarded the Mississippi. Okay. Portsmouth, Virginia. And the Mississippi, what what class of ship was it? It was a what? The the battleship Mississippi was the heaviest armament and strongest and mightiest warship the United States owned at that time. And there were three ships, Mississippi, New Mexico, and Idaho, there were sister ships all alike. And they were old old frigates like with uh, wire cages going up for the lookout, and they converted them in 1933. They only cost a million and a half, or a few million, three and a half million to begin with, but it took 33 million to convert them and to modernize them in 1933. And they were all modernized and and uh, regular bridges put on them, and, and the old battleship look was taken off of them. But she was still, the Mississippi was still, because it, it had the gutter on it, the gutter's mate. The, I mean, the top gunner, the one that was, could, took care of fire control. Not just a gutter on a gun, he was the gunner that ordered the guns to fire and so on. Yeah. And uh, so we were the, uh, the we, we, we were sent then to, uh, uh, down through the Straits of Cuba and down through the Panama Canal and we went over to uh, Long Beach and San Francisco and we thought when they complained to San Francisco why we're not out doing something they'd send us to Long Beach and when we were in Long Beach quite a while they complained we thought we'd, and they'd send us to San Francisco. <laughs> well uh, I just read the history of that and we were reconnoitering and we was doing more than just going from one town to another. Right. We was out there and we were defending and keeping the Japanese off of the West Coast. Right. <laughs> yeah, they didn't know after Pearl Harbor but what the Japs would come on into That's right. mainland uh, U.S. Uh, there was a submarine that did come in and it, and it left, uh, uh, sent a bomb over and, and it landed in Nevada somewhere. But they sent it over by a 
parachute yeah, drop. Well, it, it wasn't a very big one. It was just a, to let you know they were there. Right. <laughs> and uh, but after that, uh, we went to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, and there we saw, of course, the devastation. I worked on uh, the California that was sunk and helped them get the cans of powder off of it and uh, dump and so we could salvage the cans because they were still good solid aluminum cans. And uh, then after that, uh, we were sent on a mission. We were sent to Attu. Attu, yeah. While, while uh, they were taken midway, the Japanese were there and so on and and we had to defend there. They snuck into Attu and Kiska. And so they deployed the battleship Mississippi with a couple of destroyers to Attu. And we circled Attu for 102 days. Really? And uh, as we, one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, I just looked up the record, we expended 400 armor piercing shells. We caught nine cargo carrying submarines evacuating at two. Is that right? And uh, all it mentions in the record is that we had a, a, a midnight a, a, a night action. Well, the the blimps <laughs> left the surface and we claimed that we sunk them. However, we couldn't prove it so we didn't get credit for it. Anyway, uh, after that, we went up to Kiska and, and uh, wanted to clear it out. And uh, uh, there was a, a big splash there. We thought that the submarine had come down on tracks. And on further examination, it was a large whale. And we, Very big whale. We got that, we got that whale. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there was others at Kiska and Anchitka that we had to clean out. Mm -hmm. And so we rooted them from the Illusion Islands, a thousand mile war, and went into Dutch Harbor at Parley's Arts and had a little R&R. Uh, R&R, &R. R &R, okay. <laughs> and then we sang the song, you know, don't take me to uh, Frisco, take me back to Kiska, that's where I will tarry, you know, I'm too old. And, then we'd sing, who's that guy with the red goes on down to Louisiana? And then we, there was some guy aboard ship that would always make up songs and so on and so then of course we sang them just for a pastime. But anyway, we did leave for uh, Dutch Harbor and uh, we came down to uh, the Gilberts and Tarawa. And of course at Tarawa we lost 3,000 Marines. Uh, and we determined that we wouldn't lose it made Bacon Island. So at Bacon Island we lined up five battleships. And the Mississippi was one of them. And we plastered Bacon Island till it was just nothing but toothpicks left. Nothing left. Nothing left. And so when they went in, they well, I think there was only one casualty and I think that was Maybe uh, an accident of some kind, uh, not, yes, uh, not right. enemy fire. <laughs> and uh, however, uh, the Mississippi was firing along with the rest and then brought to the test. Number two turret along with the rest was firing and uh, then all of a sudden all openings of flame. They took the main shell went in, two 100 pound bags of powder went in, the red end went in, and before the bridge was closed, it went off. And we lost, lost 43 men. And after that, of course, we, uh, we kept firing. We didn't stop. Uh, because we had a mission. So we got a commendation afterwards for for keep firing while uh, we suffered a, 
a fire warship. And we finally, we, we got the fire out and we got the men out and had a burial that night. So and how many guys, we, how many men did they lose on that? 40, 42 men and an officer, 43 wow. men. Wow, is that right? Then we uh, came back to Pearl and on the way back from Pearl, from the bridge we spotted a aircraft carrier that taken a bomb down the stack, a baby flat top, and uh, it was totally in flames, and uh, they could see the little ants as all the men looked like, you know, they were dropping off of the edge of the runway, and coming down into water that was full of, gre full of uh, oil, and uh, they lost 900 men uh, that morning. Wow. Uh, because they couldn't, <laughs> there was just no, no way anybody could help them, you know, it was, it went down in, I think, 18 minutes after the bomb went off and it was back. So uh, anyway, uh, then we made it back to uh, Pearl Harbor, and while I was there, they called my name, and uh, I was up, I was up at the, grocery store. I was up at a bomb shelter. They had a young lady up there that was a daughter and, and uh, we, we used to communicate a little bit and, uh, and uh, all I did was do what she did. I didn't know what to do when I went in this church. It was a Catholic church and they kind of knelt and got up and you know this and that. And so I just followed suit and uh, I didn't pull any blunders I guess. And then after that way my name was called, I was uh, not present, and they finally told me that my name was being called, so I went to see what they wanted, and they wanted me immediately to go aboard ship. I was supposed to go back to the United States and take over a, a, a commissary on a uh, large vessel, but a uh, cargo ship of some kind. And I was going aboard the AKA-4 combat cargo ship with 40 ton booms. We could load a fully loaded uh, tank and a fully loaded six by down into a tank lighter and send it ashore. And so uh, I went aboard the USS Electra. And uh, we had, and it was there, I was a second class cook and a made first class cook. And they put me in charge of the galley and so I had my first uh, responsibility of being in charge of a, of a food service aboard a ship. We only had 333 men aboard, but when we take troops aboard, we would take 1,500 troops aboard, and then uh, that little galley got busy. <laughs> oh, I guess so. Huh? But anyway, uh, after uh, being aboard her a while at Saipan, uh, well, I guess I should back up. We had, uh, first off, we went to uh, it must have been Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. And uh, I was always telling the cock when I was going to come aboard, you know, and go ashore. Or I was cookie, so whatever cookie, anything cookie wanted, he got. And so he'd tell me to come on down. So I climbed down the old rope ladder and got in the tank ladder and went ashore. Well, I was, I was hunting souvenirs over there, the airplanes and Isaac glass and, and aluminum. I wanted to make one of those knives, you know, that you have a flag in the handle of it and, and the Isaac glass around the handle and so on. All the guys was making them and I wanted to do it too. And uh, <clears throat> however, I could see that he was trying to get off of the, off of the coral and back up and get it, get and leave, and and so out of my pockets, I, I ditched everything. I didn't end up with a thing, and I had to run out the water and and run up the the grate in the front of the landing grate in order to get back aboard. And after that, I uh, I didn't go ashore until I got to Osaka, which the war was over, and I wasn't worried about it then. <laughs> <laughs> there was no battle going on ashore there. Yeah, but anyway. <clears throat> 
progeny was quite a, that was the first time I had seen a, a dead soldier kind of blown up in the, sun, in the heat of the sun and, and it was kind of a sickly thought. But anyway, uh, after we finished with Kwajalein and Anuitok and Perry Island and Bikini, we went out of the Marshall Group <clears throat> and the next now, the, you, you were on a troop, troop transport? I was on a combat cargo ship with 40 ton boobers aboard it. It would, it would carry tanks and, and, and guns okay. and all kind of cargo. Okay. The cargo that went, went ashore with them to, to keep supplying them after we sent them ashore. Okay. Yeah, we had big uh, tank lighters aboard and we had personnel carriers aboard. We had about 31 boats aboard that we could launch and put personnel in and send them to the beach. Send them ashore. Yeah. Yeah, it was a it was a ship that was a, a landing craft ship. Right. Uh, really. And so, uh, <clears throat> uh, being aboard her for uh, truck Peleliu and those invasions, uh, we normally lost one man, as I was saying before, in each in each invasion for some some reason or another. And then we went down into uh, <clears throat> the Solomon Islands, and uh, well. When I was still on the Mississippi, I should mention that we went into New Guinea, and uh, that was my first experience with seeing natives and walk around naked. That was <laughs> quite an experience. <laughs> and uh, but anyway, we went ashore there because that's where the spotters were on the island, uh, and spotting for the Japanese fleet when they went by, and they would tell the central headquarters where the fleet was bumping to and so on. And uh, we wasn't there very long. Uh, it was uh, it was kind of a hot, sweaty, uh, swampy land that wasn't really where you'd want to stay very long anyway. So uh, after we left off of there, we did go to uh, Guadalcanal where I was in the uh, well, there was a nurses barracks up the beach and they had marine guards there guarding us. I guess it was guarding the, the nurses, but anyway, we weren't allowed to go in that direction. <laughs> they brought some beer out for us and it was greener and gourds and I remember that I sold mine for a dollar can because I didn't drink anyway. And uh, then they would fill, there was a little, little lake in there. A uh, uh, freshwater lake, and they'd put dynamite in these cans, and put a fuse in there, light it, and throw it over into the lake, and and blow up the fish. And then they'd wait out and gather the fish up. And so they brought them aboard that night, and we fried, cleaned yep. the fish, and fried the fish up for those that that had brought them in. And uh, we did a little R and R with our with our. Uh, men that were aboard too, you know, we didn't just act like we were King Tut. We were hard workers and you work in a galley in the South Pacific and and you're sweating all the time and uh, right. it's, it's uh, we had a galley that was prepared for 900 and uh, uh, we was feeding uh, 2300 out of it. So we had to railroad everything we was doing there. Anyway, after we uh, left that area, uh, we went to Leyte. Now, Leyte was uh, one of the islands in the Philippines. It was the first island that was hit in the Philippines. And uh, I watched there as a, a Betsy bomber came over to bomb one of our ships and, and two P-38s come underneath underneath and went out and fired on it and of course it burst into flames and it, it headed for a ship that just the wing hit it and knocked off a, a life, life preserver area thing, life raft. 
and uh, otherwise, uh, that's where I went ashore again. Now I had acquired a, a 38 caliber pistol that I had in my belt loaded with shells, and I always went ashore, of course, two, but never alone. So I had a buddy with me, and we followed MacArthur into the landing, and uh, he was on one of the lead ships, of course, when he went in, and we, we landed at a place where there was four big poles and a overhead, it was a way station uh, to get out of the sun, a shelter place is all it was. And uh, so they moved out and they were gone by the time I waded ashore and I looked around, never saw a soul. Well, they went about six miles down the beach to Loch Lobin. Now, not Ireland, Loch Lobin, but Loch Lobin that is in the Philippines. And that's where they met the first resistance. Anyway, we didn't see reason why we should hang around there anymore, so uh, our boat was waiting for us, and we went out and got on the, on the boat and, uh, and went back aboard ship. That was uh, Leyte. Leyte, the Japanese fleet come up and decided to rout us, and they come up sir, through the Suriango Straits, and the battleship Mississippi was the command with the Admiral aboard it, and four other battleships laid across the straits broadside. See, you can't shoot dead ahead or aft. You have to shoot starboard Side. or port. Yeah. So they was they was where they could shoot port. They could shoot to the left. And here these Japanese battleships and cruisers and destroyers came up. Our PT boats was for us, and uh, they came up through the straits, and we waited till, like Admiral Perry said, you know, wait till you see the, the whites of their eyes and then start firing. We waited to where they were about 800 yards away, wow. and then we fired on them point blank and just blew them out of the water. And they was, after that battle, well, one battle, just after that one they were, that we had. But that stopped them from coming in into Lady stopping our operation. Then the Japanese decided to muster every ship they had, and they come at us with about 400 warships. And at Hollandia, we had 700 warships. And so we started bringing our fleet out of Hollandi at that time. It took us three days to get them all out and form into battle fleets. And uh, Bull Halesley, an old rogue admiral, he took a fleet up because they brought in the aircraft carriers that at Guam, they called it the turkey shoot, they shot down 400 airplanes. These carriers had no sting lamps, they were just empty carriers. But he went up there and we needed him down here, but he left us. But that was the largest battle I was in. Uh, we had a piston blowed out, and so we was repairing one engine. We was lipping along on one engine. And uh, I was down in the engine room watching them. They had the uh, uh, overhead uh, uh, wheels where they raised this piston up and bring it along and let it sit down into the socket where it belonged. Anyway, they got it running and up and going. And uh, we had the, somebody had taken a smoke pot, smoke pot machine and took the sediment bulb off of it, cleaning the gun was the one three inch gun we had, and that was where I was brought into the ship's uh, office one night to find out who it was because they had a sediment bulb with a fingerprint on it. So I found a man. It was it was it was a, a, a gunner's mate, second class petrol. I'll never forget his name. He's the one that took that sediment bottle, left it off, so we couldn't make smoke and cover us up. So that night, we had, when the crew came down from topside, they said that three huge bombs just missed a fantail and splashed water up on the poop deck. Well, the poop deck is pretty high off the, on those, those kind of ships, you know, sure. off of the water line. And if to splash water up on it, it was 
Those was big bombs. But we escaped uh, again. Anyway, that takes care of the largest battle that was ever fought of surface warships, 1,200 of them, and last one that'll never be fought. After that, uh, I was not in the battle for Guam. Uh, I got in the battle next time. We loaded in Pearl and went to Saipan. And uh, I was there, and there was a destroyer next to me. It was just laying off 500 yards to my port. And it was firing and just deepening my ears. I couldn't hardly have to keep them stuffed with cotton all the time. and uh, But they just kept firing day and night. They fired for, I guess, uh, two or three days. And finally, one evening, the whole mountainside, uh, Mount, that was uh, Tapachka, blew up. Well, that's what they was after. They was after their ammunition dump. Trying to hit the dump. And they finally hit the dump, and the whole side of the mountain blew up. Well, they quit firing then. <laughs> we, but when that thing went off, in our doors, passageways, we had a we had a door here and a, and a door here, and of course, just little hooks, you know, to fasten them. Well, they was just <laughs> they they were just coming off their hinges, just about. But they they were just flapping, and uh, we was glad that that was over with. Anyway, at Saipan, uh, a duck came aboard. A duck is a vehicle that goes on land or sea, and it has, it's a boat that has wheels on it. And it had a, a 30 caliber M1 carbine in it, and uh, <clears throat> at midnight I went out and uh, requisitioned that carbine <laughs> and took it and slung it from a string behind my locker. Well, when we brought our Marines aboard at uh, uh, at Iwo, the sergeant that was assigned to us in the galley, he cleaned it and got a good firing shape. He says, it's in perfect shape. Didn't have a sling for it, but anyway, uh, they were ready to, we were at Iwo now, and the Marines were leaving the ship. They were, we were putting it, going down over the side, going down in the tank ladders. Here he come running. All right. He says, some, I don't forget what he said, but red-headed Irishman or something like that, stole one of my men's guns. And he says, I've got to have that gun. I says, well, Sarge, you know where it's at. Go get it. So I supplied a gun for a man that went ashore on Evo, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, who else could have done it? But uh, somebody that had one that was, available that he knew it was available that's the way it worked out. He went down and got the gun, didn't have a sling on it, and of course the rest of them, you know, they had theirs with a sling and they could carry their heavy loads and all. He had to hang on to his, but he was glad to have that gun. <laughs> so he went ashore the first day and uh, and uh, they had quite a slaughter on uh, Iwo. I don't know if you've ever uh, read the book Flags of Our Fathers, but uh, anyway, that book tells of the battle for Iwo. And in 36 days, we lost uh, 8,000 dead, 10,000 casualties American, and 20,000 dead Japanese. Uh, they came aboard uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we gave them a steak dinner. <laughs> we had it ready for them when the, those that were left over and those that were left over, this group that I met, met them in the in the barber shop where we had a card game going. Anyway, they uh, had a they taken a, a watch from one of the officers. There was some officers in the bomb crater just before they came got off the island, and they dropped over some hand grenades over there. And then they went in and took their jewelry. Well, this one had a watch that had a broken face on it. It was Empire. On the jacket was a silver back on it. 
had little Jeff going up to a little house, which I imagine was a latrine or something, I don't know. Anyway, little hut. And uh, I brought that back and had it repaired, and uh, I could never get the five dollars to get it out of hock. So <laughs> I, I never, I lost it. I was, I was rather poor when I got out of the service. Uh, anyway, uh, then after uh, Evo was over, uh, we came back and took Marines to uh, Osaka. And I went ashore in Osaka, and uh, I thought maybe I'd barter something. I went over to the train station, and they just back up from me. I couldn't. I had a, I probably had a half a slab of bacon and a, and five pounds of sugar or something. You know, I had, I was going to barter for something, and they wouldn't get near us. They just backed up quickly, and so I thought, well, I don't blame them. You know, the, the two bombs had gone off. Right. And uh, they probably thought we was men from. Mars or something, I don't know, but anyway, I was defeated, I had to leave. They had a little gap at each corner, they had a little bonfire at each corner for street lights. The train ran down the, ran down the ditch at the edge of the street. This was uh, pretty chaotic conditions. They say if they hadn't have surrendered, that Japan would have starved in three months. They were out of food, and they couldn't get food in. And so it was a blessing that well, they, they couldn't do anything but surrender. They had nothing left to, no will, not, nothing left to fight with, you know. So, I was talking to a lady the other day at a 50th wedding anniversary, and she said, I was at Nagasaki when the bomb went off. I says, you were. She says, I was a girl at eight years old. And I says, uh, oh my goodness. She said, and she said, you're talking to me. I said, yeah, why shouldn't I be? And, well, they don't talk to Japanese around here. I said, well, I do. <laughs> why wouldn't I? So uh, we kind of swapped stories a little bit and, and got acquainted. And she lives just out of town from where I live there in, in Sydney. Anyway, I suppose that just about winds up uh, accepting what I did aboard ship. I did, I did study with the Institute of Applied Science, and I, I, I took a correspondence course in criminal identification investigation, and uh, learned uh, fingerprinting, and I worked for the ship there, and and, and uh, identified a man that took a sediment bow off of a smoke pot machine and uh, turned him in to the authorities. And uh, other than that, a, bo a board ship, that ship, and that's the Bible that I carried all through the Navy. And uh, and I studied, and, and on top of number two turret, I, I memorized scripture and learned where the handlebar was, which was, of course, the, the text where the verse was found. And uh, so that's where I got started. Uh, the, the library was smoke filled and you couldn't stand to be in there. Mm. So we got out on where there was nice fresh air out on top of number two turret, right below the captain. Ocker I was up there and threw a horse blanket out on that old 14 inches of cold steel and, and, and studied the Bible and memorized scripture verses of which many of them I know today. Good for you. But that's probably why I, uh, at age, uh, well, when I got out of the service, I just built a new home, and I sold it. I felt a call to the ministry, and went down to Center Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, and uh, uh, studied. I was there for three years, and uh, studied to uh, be a minister. I pastored one church, and uh, after I pastored that one church, I decided that I was really called to be a teacher, not a preacher. So I taught the sanctuary Bible class in a lot of large churches where I've had as high as 300 in a class uh, in my history, uh, and that about 
tells a story, I guess, unless you got some questions to ask me about something else. I don't you. know whether I was supposed to just keep talking or what, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, now listen, you got out of the service, you, you went into the ministry, and then you later got into food service. And, and you uh, ran a big food service for Regis? I never did get out of the food service. While I was at the Bible school, <clears throat> I took over the uh, the food service at the Bible school <laughs> and, and became the cafeteria manager there. And we had 900 students in there, and I would feed them three days. Sorry. <laughs> I, and I would three, feed them three meals a day, and I got to where I was the buyer. I wrote the menus, and of course I had my Navy uh, uh, recipe cards that I used. Yeah. And uh, I had a big rotary oven that I got blown out of one day, lighting it. <laughs> kind of cleaned my uh, eyelashes a little, a little bit. But anyway, uh, after managing it, I went to uh, Internal Revenue in Kansas City. Now in Kansas City, I had uh, 3,700 people, captive audience, in, in the building. And I had a three-line cafeteria. I had a, a luncheon line, uh, a whatnot line, which was uh, like soup and sandwich and things of this nature and breakfast. And the third line was, uh, uh, was sandwiches and, and fruit, just, and just bottled drink only. So I had three lines running, and uh, I was there for two and a half years. Then I went to, uh, I moved up to Job Corps up in uh, Air Park One in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I taught tool stations uh, for the Job Corps. I taught bakery tool stations there. And uh, after I finished there, uh, I, Yes, it was that I ended up somehow at the University of Colorado. They wanted a, there was a, there was a manager they hired and his brother was in an accident out in California, he had to leave. So they needed someone, they were desperate for somebody. <laughs> and so I, I showed up on their doorstep and I said, uh, this old man was, he was blowing cigar smoke in my face and looking with his horn rim glasses, you know, and, and he says, don't you think it's about time you settle down, son? <laughs> I said, yes. I said, I'd like to. So he offered me a, a, a salary, and I said, well, I said, uh, I gotta accept it, but I'll be looking for a job tomorrow. Oh, oh well, what do you mean? I says, I can't, I can't live on that. I got a family. I got, I got four kids at home yet. <laughs> I said, I have a wife, and I said, I have to have more. Well, what are you going to have? And so I told him, I think at the time I was $9,000, <laughs> which was today, you know, but that was then. That was in, that was in uh, 70, well, let's see, that was, that was about 60, 71, I guess. So it was way back there. <laughs> and I, Got the job at the University of Colorado, and uh, I had Baker Hall, the toughest hall because it had all the football players in there. They'd line food up on the table and they'd laugh at you. And so I learned every one of their names, and when they come into mess hall, I spoke their name. I said, "Hi, John. Hi, Elmer. Hi, whatever it was," and they would. And I got me a, a, a black mammy from, from Panama. She come up and was there. And she was an excellent cook, Cajun cooking, I mean. I hired her for a cook. And one of the guys says, what you need is a black mammy in here. I said, I want you to come in the kitchen. Follow me in here. I want to introduce you to somebody. Here, this, this lady's name is Inez. I said, uh, do you think she's black enough? He was just out of this. He didn't know what to, he, he was speechless. Well, after that, 
no more food was lined up on the tables. And I said, fellows, look, if you want something special, talk to me. I can make just about anything you want to, you want to eat. I said, I've been a chef in the better, better areas around the world. I said, uh, you know, right. we're, we're going to take care of you here. Yeah. Don't worry. Boy, I would have more, more chairs broken because they'd be rocking back on them, you know, and yeah. busting the legs. And, and I had no more chairs broken, no more food spread out on the table. But if they wanted an extra dessert, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, we got along fine with them. And after that, I went to the, they closed Baker Hall. They just were, were combining dining rooms and extending service hours. And so they put me over as, they wanted somebody to be a production manager. So they hired me to go in with the, in, the, in this office there was already a, a lady in there that was a, a taking care of the, the, the menus. She was a registered dietitian. And uh, so she finally decided to leave. And so after she left, they gave me the menus. Do you want me to quit? Oh, and, uh, uh, and so after that, uh, when I took over the menus and took over the production, uh, I, they put me in charge of uh, quality control and uh, sanitation and safety. And, and I, was, I was responsible for repair and replacement. And so I had, uh, I purchased new ovens and new grills and new uh, garburetors and, and kept them in storage and uh, new power machines, buffalo choppers. We got everything in for those ladies. And fortunately, we never got any figures cut off at them either. I, I told them, I showed them films and them, uh, National Education Media had films. I showed them, uh, you know, that, that grinder is just like a, a mouth of a lion, you know, don't, you wouldn't stick your mouth in a lion, would you? Well, don't stick it in there. Yeah. And uh, so we got them trained to uh, uh, use the equipment like they should and have a cool head for salads. We, we, we put the lettuce in a big privilege to go into Tokyo Bay and to take that identical berth just, just yards away from downtown Tokyo. Wow. And it was it was honored to take that that uh, uh, spot, and and it took it. That they thought they would have the surrender signed aboard it, but they this guy that takes no BS uh, wanted it on to Missouri because he was from Missouri. So <laughs> that's okay. It, it was on the battleship Missouri. Yeah, and I know that MacArthur took that. Uh, no, that was Truman. That was Truman. Truman. Oh yeah, Truman. Yeah. yeah. The well, that, that's why they wanted it on the Missouri, huh? Right, because he's from Independence, Missouri. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yes. Did you tell them about the lady you met that was a girl at that time? Oh, yeah. Well, is that Betty Shimamoto? Was that, uh, the, you mean down a crook? Um, it probably is. I, I didn't know she lived in Yeah, there. I think Betty, uh, I think Betty was a, uh, yeah, a girl, you know, uh, my wife. Old, she, hmm? said, she was eight years old, she said, when the bomb went yeah, out. Yeah, I think that was Betty Shimamoto. You know Betty. I, I, think, okay. I think that's who it was. And Ted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I met her at uh, my friend's uh, 50th wedding anniversary. It was at the lodge there, the the, the uh, lion's den in, in uh, Cedric. Yeah. And uh, she, said, that's who it was. she <laughs> said it was, she couldn't understand why I was talking to her. She says, well... My wife used to they, talk to her in Japanese. They usually don't... Oh. Said, Let's see what well, Japanese. They don't talk to... I'm Japanese. I said, so? <laughs> I couldn't understand that one. But I guess some she people are just that way. She's probably giving you... Okay, this is a BB-54, the battleship Mississippi, that just about drowned in the North Atlantic and just about caught fire and burned up in the Pacific. But it lived to tell the story and came into New Orleans victorious, bringing the Mississippi flag back to the great state of Mississippi and flying it from the yard arm at the state capitol. 
and I was a sergeant in the mess sergeant in the. This is when I was in the field artillery battalion, and uh, I was a mess sergeant. We had a limb lift while so I was there, the and the adjutant general from uh, Des Moines, Iowa, came out, and he he said after we ate some of our fried chicken, we fixed in one of the big heavy aluminum roasting. Uh, 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 Here's some of uh, Arthur Anderson's uh, medals and uh, <clears throat> patches to show his rank when he was in the Navy and two of the ships that he was on and a picture of him in his uh, uh, Navy outfit and Here's one of the ships that he was assigned to, which he uh, told us about when he uh, was on the uh, camera. And this is the uh, battleship that he was assigned to, which I think was the Mississippi. So he had a distinguished career, career in the Navy, and... Uh, served our country well. He's a true hero of World War II and the Navy. And we really appreciate him.